I'm very pleased today to be joined by Adam Frisch from the third district of Colorado, who is the candidate running against Lauren Boebert. This is the second time around. He lost by 534 votes when he ran against her in 2022. Her removal from office is a paramount concern, not just for the people in that community, but all across America, because she is a paragon of imbecility, unfitness, who disgraces her community with her presence under the Capitol Dome. So before we get into the conversation, I want to welcome Adam. Tell this audience how they find your campaign, where they go, how they send money to it, how they can support, how they can get involved, and how they can volunteer from anywhere in the country to help the good people of the Western Slope in the Rocky Mountains rid themselves of this pestilence. Good day to you, Steve. Thanks so much. Big fan of uh, what you've been working on uh, over your entire career. It's great to be here. Um, glad to go right, right to the punchline. Uh, Adam for Colorado, F-O-R, adamforcolorado.com is our website. There's a big button to donate, uh, which is always great. We're doing super well, but we're going to need a good amount of resources to tell our story. Uh, Club for Growth and some other organizations have already made this race in CD3 one of their top four or five races, and they have a $20 million price tag they're looking to put on my head, for lack of a better term. There's also a big volunteer button, and whether you live in our district or in the state of Colorado or around the country, um, or if you're an American citizen overseas, uh, please get on that volunteer basis. We're accumulating a lot of names, and we have a lot of them from all over the country, literally, obviously focused on our district. But there's a lot of excitement to help, and there's all sorts of ways to help, whether it's door knocking or phone calling or postcard writing or reaching out to people um, that live in the western part and the southern part of Colorado. So thanks for asking that right off the bat. So so you grew up in New York. No, but actually, I'd, I'm guilty of living there for 12 years. It was a great 12 years right after college. I was born on an Indian reservation in northeastern Montana, right where the North Dakota-Canada border comes together. My father spent two years working for the Indian Health Service uh, and as a young doctor, and he went on to become an OBGYN for about 45, 50 years. Both my mom and my dad are from northern Minnesota. My dad's father came over from Europe and opened up a little uh, grocery store with um, my grandfather's two brothers, Frisch's Market, uh, in the Iron Range of northern Minnesota. My dad grew up in a mining town. And my mom's grandparents came over from Europe and opened up a cattle trading business. And my cousin is now the fourth generation owner operator of uh, a feed store and grain elevator. So after five years in Montana, I grew up in Minneapolis. I was there from kindergarten through high school um, and a nice upbringing. I was, you know, loved by both parents, which was obviously super helpful these days. And did a little bit of ski racing. My misspent youth was on the little hills of Minnesota. Went out to the University of Colorado uh, at Boulder to uh, ski race and get an education in college. Um, I ended up getting hurt, so I ended up not racing, but went off to New York City uh, in the summer of 90, was there for 12 years. I left after a lot of 9-11 funerals uh, and just wanted to clear my head, but showed up with no job and a non-Ivy League education. And so people in finance and banking weren't that interested in talking to me. So Hopped into waiting tables for about a year, which was a great experience, and then kind of fell into working uh, on the investment management side for a couple of years. Uh, during that time there in the early 90s, I actually was on the, on the 101st floor of the World Trade Center in 1993, that February, when that the first um, terrorist attack happened down there in the World Trade Center. And after a couple of years, ended up getting involved in the global foreign exchange markets and spent time in about 50 different countries and traveled and did business in about another 50 and spent a couple of years working in seven World Trade Center uh, as well. And that's the building uh, that fell down that afternoon on 9-11. On I was working in Midtown, which is a couple of miles north of the World Trade Center downtown on 9-11. On and obviously it kind of shook my core as it did for many people and hung around for a little bit and then did some funerals and figured I would 
take some time to clear my head in the winter of 0102 and ended up meeting the proverbial girl uh, in the western slope of Colorado. She was a washed up ski racer as well and spent some time in New York. And so we hung out for a while and moved to Aspen about 20 years ago to uh, build a community and do some business here. And we've been uh, in the Western Slope uh, since November of 2020 or 2003. Do you recall the first time in your life that you saw the Rocky Mountains and the impression they made on you? Yeah, I was um, I was probably about seven or eight. Uh, my dad and I drove out from Minnesota uh, in the old station wagon. He was attending a, a conference or something uh, in Snowmass, and uh, even then I came out and had these thoughts that um, I was going to find out whatever it was going to take to come back to this beautiful mountain range in western Colorado at some point. I ended up coming out uh, at a young age and just kind of fell in love with it and figured I'd come back at some point, uh, came back a little bit sooner than planned, but it's just been beautiful. And it's just a great place to be, as you know yourself, uh, clean air, clean living. And, you know, it's a wide variety of people out here. We have some, you know, our, our, our district um, is bigger than the state of Pennsylvania and half the state of Colorado, and it's a wide variety of people out here, but uh, the mountains are beautiful and the people are even better. I distinctly remember you, my first impression of seeing those mountains, and I had the experience this summer with my son, and I've written about it, driving across the country, and we crossed the U.S. border back into Montana, south of Waterton, Alberta, and then came across the state uh, on U.S. Route 2, on that on that northern border, about 20 miles from Canada, uh, through uh, a lot of reservation land in eastern Montana, uh, through the uh, Bear Paw Battlefield, where Chief Joseph delivers one of the great speeches, most tragic speeches in American history, as the Nez Perce surrender uh, to the Federal Army hours literally short of safety, coming across into North Dakota, into the iron bound range. And this is a part of the country that so few Americans uh, will ever see. It's stunning in its uh, beauty. Um, the plains as they rise up, Ken Burns will uh, be releasing very shortly a new documentary about uh, the American bison. And yep. it's an extraordinary thing to drive and ponder that uh, 120 years ago, there were 30 million animals on these, on these planes. And the American impulse has always been to move West crossing those planes. It's a enormous part of America's story uh, its myth, uh, the resiliency, the character of its people, great uh, degradations of humanity took place while while crossing uh, those plains. You know, you grew up on an Indian reservation. You know, certainly have uh, you know a great connection and sense to you know some tragic elements of of America's story. You wind up. In Colorado, you find the person you are married to, like everybody of our generation. We're impacted by 9-11. Um, I was having a conversation the other day with someone who's approximately our age and was trying to explain the period of optimism that was the 1990s. Bill Clinton's bridge to the 21st century, Pax Americana, the Cold War was over, uh, the internet was in its infancy. And 25 years later, um, the 21st century is well underway, a quarter over, and it is very, very different uh, than what I imagined it would be at the dawn of the millennium in 2000. And that really has nothing to do with political parties, 
Uh, it has to do with the reality of the world we find ourselves in now. How, how do you see the world, um, particularly as someone who has seen so much of it, um, has lived in a unique part of the country? What did you learn about America from your travels abroad? Yeah, no, Steve, you know, we're talking about some big stuff and it's important stuff and it doesn't get enough conversation and it's not something that gets in a soundbite or or in a tweet, right? It's hard to believe uh, that there was actually a budget surplus. I know those two words haven't been used uh, in the English language in a really long time, but those mid to late 90s, there actually was a budget surplus and it's hard to believe uh, that we're just going in the completely the wrong direction. You know, I, th I think that during the time you were talking about, and, and until recently, it, the country, you know, and not to be euphemistic, um, it was the shining beacon on the hill for sure. I mean, I, you know, there's a reason why so many people uh, want to come to this country, uh, regardless of their economic or educational background. It is truly a land of opportunity. It's truly unique in, in the breadth and the depth of the variety that we have in our country from Manhattan and San Francisco and L.A. to the beautiful South to some of the most uh, beautiful plains in North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, uh, Utah, where you live. And, you know, there's just, there was just a lot of uh, opportunity and, and a lot of optimism. And obviously, that's just not where we sit right now especially lately in the past couple of days what's with the super heavy heart what's happened over in in the middle east and we're just been fractured and i'm not sure if it's as simple to go back to the mid 90s when the and the cable news network started and then it got turbo boosted uh when the internet social media and the iphone were created but there's certainly something to be said about the fractured place we're in um in the united states I don't travel very much overseas anymore, um, but you know, in in that in those years from the mid '90s through the end of '01, um, you know, I was across the country, I was across the world, Asia, Africa, Middle East, Latin America. There's very few places I didn't go, except for didn't spend a lot of time in Eastern Europe. But again, it, it was uh, this idea that there were a lot of institutions in the United States, how the banking system worked, how capitalism worked, how our government worked, that still allowed um, people to aspire uh, and look up to where we are as a country. And we still, I believe, and I am an optimist deep down, there's a lot of great stuff in our country, um, regardless of race and religion and educational background, whether it's informal or formal. And that there's just, we just got to figure out how to get over some really trying times. And it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick, but not to sound hokey. This is one of the reasons I decided to get into this conversation a couple of years ago when the current representative made some comments and had a deep, long conversation with my wife, Katie, uh, who's on our school board. And I spent eight years doing elected community service as well on city council here. And uh, my very politically aware at the time, 16 year old son talking about when, you know, there's times when it's really important to stand up. And I think for those that are standing up in today's public sector, public service, regardless of party affiliation, um, the vast majority of us are really trying to figure out how to bring back uh, the country and, and do some healing. I still believe you know, and I've driven 40,000 miles probably now, 25,000 miles last cycle in a red Ford pickup truck. Those 25,000 miles was with my son, Felix, and spent probably 80% of the time talking to non-Democrats. Our district is 22% um, registered Democrats. And, you know, you learn a lot. And I realized, you know, 90% of the people are on the same page about what's important to them. And I, I believe maybe 80% of the people in Congress, even now to this day, are trying to make the country a better place. The problem is uh, the fringes um, are taking up 95% of cable news and 95% of the Twitter space. But a good amount of people, Democrat and Republican, are really trying to, to kind of grind it out in those committees and those subcommittees on trying to make their district, regardless of Republican or Democrat, a better place. And it might sound a little hokey now, but I, I believe it in my heart and and on on the soul of my children. This is what's important. What got me um, off my couch to get working on this? So, 
you just said something important there, right? You said get getting off your couch to go working on this, but you know, you're being a little bit unfair to yourself there. Um, in that a lot of people on the warning community, which is which is growing uh, a vibrant place of discussion, will ask, what can I do? And what I say to them is to get involved um, in their communities where I I do a terrible job, right? Like as a as a citizen, right? I, I'm very disconnected to my local community, it's local politics. I flew hundreds of thousands of miles a year traveling. You know, I just, I wasn't here, wasn't involved, but you got very involved. You served on local appointed uh, positions. You were involved in the financial management of the county. Um, the county is not like the federal government, right? It can't just start printing its own currency, right? You have to yep. balance budgets, act reasonably, responsibly, pragmatically, make sure the taxpayer is getting a dollar value for a dollar spent. You got involved in local uh, office. Uh, your wife was involved in, in local office. And when you're talking about these issues, and there can be all sorts of divisive issues in a community, but typically they're not tribal in the way that they are in Washington, D.C. But you're someone who is serving your community. You're involved in the, in the civic life. And you make a decision. I, I just can't abide that this woman is my congresswoman. Tell, tell, talk to me about that. And I, I and I and I want to just say, and I'm like a prelude to it. And I'm going to say something provocative, and I'm going to say something in my native New Jersey dialect, um, which is this: I'm driving from Park City to Aspen, and because I used to be at the NRCC early in my career, which is the political campaign arm of the House Republicans, and in a redistricting year. There was a time when I was completely fluent on where every congressional district line was exactly. I'm not anymore, but proximate. I know that I'm near Lauren Boebert's congressional district as I'm driving through. And I'm thinking yeah. to myself, am I in it? Am I on the edge of it? And finally get through a town. I go, now I know I'm in it. And I'm looking around. And the first thing I want people to know is how beautiful the part of the country where you live is. It is epically, magnificently, stunningly beautiful. And there are normal looking people walking around. Um, it's not some backwoods, backwater place by any stretch of the imagination. I think about Lauren Boebert. Think about Marjorie Taylor Greene. And there's about, let's call it 20, 25 of these places all over the country where you have in a congressional district 800,000 people that are being represented. It's a big number. Yeah. 800,000 people. Pick one person, right? Send them to Washington to represent the district. Um, there's a lot of stuff involved in that. You're in a competition against 435 other people to get your fair share. Yep. You have you have issues, you have constituents, you have Americans who are in Israel right now who need help getting out, right? When they when they can't get an answer from the Israeli government, when they can't get an answer, right, from the State Department, right, they call their congressional office, Social Security check, right? So all of these things are part of, of being, a, being a congressperson. I'm driving through this district, 
And my question is, the fuck is wrong with these people that they would permit this? I I get the Republican thing. I go, but you know, if we if we if we put an R next to Charlie Manson's name, you know, is he is he gonna get the vote? And so I think about Warren Bobert, and I think this Beetlejuice thing is a big deal. And and it's not like this Republican district didn't think hard about it, right? Because you fell short by 534 votes. You're a, you're and you're gonna win this time. Because decency's on the ballot. And so this person literally could not make it through a play. Could not make it through to intermission of Beetlejuice. The vaping, the lying, incredible. It was a first date. But put that aside. Is there a sense that's palpable of embarrassment? That this, do we have sent as a community this person there? This person represents us? Like a sense of shame that you pick up on, a sense of motivation of people coming together. Like this is not us. This is appalling. Right. I I I am honestly interested because she is an outlier in the outlier field, right? That's that's there, like a like a paragon of just utter absolute incandescent unfitness. But why shouldn't I look and say, I don't blame her. I blame you people. Collectively, all 800,000 of you. And it pisses me off. Just like it pisses me off in that Georgia district with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Just like it pisses me off with the Nazi dentist from Arizona, Paul Gosar. And we don't ever talk about this in the country. And obviously, you can't yell at your voters. But I'd like you to explain to me, from someone who deeply loves this beautiful part of the country, how that happened. And 100%, I'm not castigating someone I deeply admire, who's the guy who got off the couch said enough, I'm taking her on, fell short by 534 votes and said, let's go again. I love that. And that's why every person who's watching this needs to support this guy. But I honestly, I want to talk about that. Why shouldn't we be really pissed off at everybody who lives where you live? Well, I hope that's not the case, Steve. A lot to unpack there. Let's say a couple things. One, Yes, uh, we live in the most beautiful district uh, in the country. And just to give everyone a little bit of a background, it's larger than the state of Pennsylvania, half the size of Colorado. The other seven congressional uh, districts have the other half. We have all of the Utah border, the western slope. You drive through from Utah coming into Denver. We have a third of Wyoming, and we have about 90-some percent of the New Mexico border, Pueblo, Otero County, San Luis Valley, Four Corners, two Indian um, reservations down there. Um, we have oil and gas. We have Aspen Telluride and Crested Butte, three resort communities, uh, Grand Junction, which is the hub of the Western Slope. There's a lot of moving parts. Some of the most rural counties, Hinsdale in the country, 450 or 500 people in the county. Kelowna, Colorado, population 23. Um, and one of the highlights was definitely driving around. Um, and so the plan was never to really run. The, I was never planning, you know, I've stand up and done things for the community and everything else like that. And I'm I'm interested in policy more than politics, but I follow it. But the plan was never uh, to get involved at, at this level until some comments, a series of comments were made in the about two years ago. And again, I say, don't ask me what they were, but they were very on brand uh, for the current representative, some version of racist, homophobic, ignorant, whatever you want to say. 
And there's two themes that we started to talk about, and it leads into kind of a bigger conversation. It was people want the circus to stop. As I mentioned before, my buddy Dean Phillips in Minnesota, who I went to school with, high school and middle school, talked about this entertainment industry. And I thought that um, the Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and Bobert were kind of the heads of this entertainment industry, the yelling and the screaming. We're seeing some version of that. People want the circus to stop. Our um, conservatives, our Republicans, um, are very, very uh, libertarian in their conversation. They just don't want to get involved in heavy government. What, and that's why there's been a, a, a high pro-choice conversation and supportive of gay marriage. They don't really want to get into who you're marrying, who you want to love. You, it's almost like the UBU party for that crowd. But the tribalism is there. Um, and there are some really bad people that if they had an R or a D by their name, it's it just too many people in the country look on a ballot and they, they read right to left. And as soon as there's an R there or as soon as there's a D there, the conversation is over. I'll say one thing. My team gets very, you know, ad nauseum I talk about this. There are 3,150 counties in the country, 3,147 counties in the country. 2,000 of them are deemed ruled by the Department of Agriculture based on density. We have 27 counties. The vast majority of our counties are, are rural. Um, and Bill Clinton in 96 won 52% of these 2,000 rural counties in the country. Speed up to 2012, Barack Obama, President Obama won 25% of the rural counties. In 2020, uh, President Biden won fewer than 10% of the rural counties in the country. So when I when I have conversations and talk to people about the Democratic Party, I mentioned that they need to do better than 20 big cities, Aspen and Martha's Vineyard, because that's pretty much where the Democratic Party is at the moment. And monopolies are bad in politics and monopolies are bad in business. And I would argue that these 20 big cities are not getting the best version of the Democratic Party. And a lot of rural America, especially Western and Southern Colorado, are certainly not a, getting a very good version of the Republican Party. And I've said for 20 years, if there was a get stuff done party, I'd be in that party, Steve. But that party's not doing very well. And I said that two years ago. And look where the get stuff done party is right now. It's like hanging on a vine and whittling away. It's very, very sad um, about what we've seen happen, uh, obviously, internationally with Ukraine and the Mideast uh, terrorist crisis. And obviously, um, we have a house divided of epic proportions. We need more people looking at the name and who they are, as opposed to are they in Team Blue and Team Red. And if I get into a Team Red, Team Blue conversation, I'm losing by eight points. I'm going to lose by 40,000 votes. So I, I, I've i said this for a long time. I'm on 80% of us, 85% of us are on Team Colorado. And 15% people are on Team Chaos. And I'm on Team Colorado. And that's what we're really focused on. And that's why, while nobody believed that we can make up a 40,000 vote deficit, as I joke, kind of, it took my mom five times for me to finally get her on the phone to believe I could actually do this. And we ended up, you know, um, winning uh, or losing by just under 550 votes. And one of the things that got me off the couch, and there were many, Steve, was I'm into dad, as you might be able to tell, I pulled out and looked at kind of where on one side, Talib and Omar were, uh, and then Marjorie Taylor Green, Jim Jordan, Matt Gates, Paul Gosar, Andy Biggs, Marjorie Taylor Green, and realized none of them have any chance of losing with a billion dollars going into their district. But I saw in 2020, the current representative only won by five percentage points. Uh, and then sadly, after that, the Colorado Democratic Party kind of threw away CD3. They threw it under the bus because there was a new district that was coming in. We got we got an eighth district in our Colorado. We got it. I don't say we got it from California, but California went from 53 to 52. Col Col Colorado went from seven to eight. And all of a sudden, there was a 10 point deficit. And I'm like, you know, I think if, and you know this better than I do, Steve, a third of the Republican Party minimally wants their party back. People want the circus to stop. They want someone to focus on the job, not themselves. We have a lot of independent, uh, libertarian type of conversations going out with our conservatives that I fully respect 
We have lots of ranchers and farmers. They're very, very pragmatic. I've yet to meet an unpragmatic rancher. You'll be out of business in two months, right? And she's about as unpragmatic as it gets. And I'm like, I'm fully aware. The last thing the Democratic Party is looking for is some middle-aged straight white guy who lives in a mountain town, let alone Aspen, and a pretty conservative Democrat at that. And I knew another reason I decided to drive, I was going to have to drive all these miles, was once we were able to get by the primary, I was going to have to convince a lot of farmers and ranchers and small business owners in very small towns that this guy who spent 12 years in New York City lived in a mountain town, let alone Aspen, the skepticism was going to be huge. You know, the amount of people that thought I was going to have blue horns and mountain horns and Aspen horns was gigantic. And I'm, I'm I'm missing a lot of things, but somewhat self-aware my whole life. And so I decided to just hop in the pickup truck and start convincing people. And there was a gap, you know, if, if there was a, a, you know, a traditional Republican who before Lauren Boebert, all the Republicans that were running and serving were traditional Republicans. I wouldn't run. There wouldn't have been a path to victory. And I never would have thought there would be a need to because a traditional Republican could represent this district pretty darn well. Um, and a lot of our, you know, water, 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 like you know, are three top issues. And then I would get into the rural aspects of healthcare. And you know, Republicans um, get into droughts as much as Democrats and healthcare issues as well. And so, the conversation is not any who's anti-water. It's who do you want sitting down in the Colorado delegation representing you and your family and your business and your community? This is a fundamental issue. No one in the East understands the water issues in the in the American West, yep. including most of the Congress. And I guarantee you, Lauren Boebert doesn't understand any of this. And that has to be self-evident. I mean, she doesn't. There's no there's no evidence uh, to suggest that she has the intellectual capacity, uh, frankly, to digest and understand federal water policy, which is as complicated a subject matter as as there is that has enormous, enormous implications uh, for the ranchers, the cattlemen, uh, the farmers in your in your district. It's not just our district. The uh, uh, we have this Colorado. There's a Colorado through the west. Um, yeah, the whole west. We have um, the vast majority of water for 40 million people: California, Nevada, and Arizona. That's the lower basin to get a little technical, and then the upper basin: Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming. Those seven states um, are taken care of by about 40 million. About 40 million people in those seven states are looked after by the water of which 90% of it uh, flows within uh, Colorado's third district. And again, no one's anti-water, but the conversation has to do with who do you want sitting in that chair in a bipartisan manner, talking about some pretty complicated issues. And I I would be in Grand Junction, you know, in Mesa County, which is- a pretty I want Lauren Boebert. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I made that article- I, I would stand up at a lot of Chamber of Commerces and say, listen, at some point, there could be eight of us from Colorado sitting across the table from 52 people from the California delegation. Who do you want sitting in that chair representing you and your ranch, your farm, your small business, your community, your grandkids, her or me? And I would say that not because of this or that, just because who do you want sitting there? I figured if I had explained the difference, I was talking to the wrong crowd. Right. But these civic and business leaders they understand and a lot of the issues that face a lot of people in the country, but especially in the Western part of the United States, it's who do you want focusing on it and who's going to put the time and effort into it. Most of our issues um, are, you know, the caucuses that I'll be involved with in the Promise Arbors Caucus. There's a Western caucus that I hope has me. There's, I think there's 70 members of the Western caucus. There's Mary Patola uh, in Alaska who defeated uh, the political godmother of Lauren Boebert, Sarah Palin, uh, and 69 Republicans. And I, I will, I'm going to do my best to be the second Democrat in that caucus of 71 to just look after the rural aspects of health care, the rural aspects of soil health and water drought, uh, and being pro-domestic energy 
And these are the issues that that face uh, Western and Southern Colorado and, and the Western part of the United States as a whole. And people want the circus to stop and they want someone to focus on the district, not themselves. And that's something I've been resonating with with a lot of people. Again, we got 49.9% of the vote in a district that's registration is about 22 or 23% Democrat. And part of that success is because we worked our butt off and drove thousands and thousands and thousands of miles and do a lot more listening than talking and try to focus on common sense solutions and not spend my whole time on trying to be a, a Twitter star. I, um, I, uh, was I look back with a lot of regret personally on your 22 race because I had a sense uh that you could win um early talking to people in that district um I didn't really raise money using my platforms and do the things that I'm going to try to do this cycle and, you know, when you lose an election by 534 votes and it's that close, right, there's a thousand marginal things, right, could have, yeah. could have, would have, should have. And um, and so that's why I began. I think, you know, we have a large audience that I really encourage everybody who sees this to I really encourage everybody who sees this uh, to donate to Adam Frisch's campaign, and I, and I want to, and I want to tell you why. I want everybody who sees this to understand what happened in Israel. What what happened in Israel was evil manifested itself successfully because of the brokenness and incompetence of government. That's the price of this idiocy, of this populism, of imbeciles, extremists, in positions. What Bibi Netanyahu did in Israel was divide the country against itself. Sound familiar, everyone? Fill the government with extremists. Sound familiar, everyone? Fill the government with incompetence. Sound familiar, everyone? And then ignore every single warning by the professional security experts with regard to the country's preparedness. And the result of that is an attack that adjusted for population, if it had happened on American soil, would have killed 40,000 Americans. And now what will result from this is a war that is immoral, like all wars, but just because murder is wholly different than the civilian casualties that are inevitably caused by war. And that is the inherent immorality of all war. General MacArthur spoke to this. This war will likely escalate. The world is at a very dangerous place. And people like Lauren Boebert, in the end, I, ha I have no doubt about saying this whatsoever, that it is true. They will get Americans killed at a industrial level in the butcher's bill counts of thousands and we've seen the terrible 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 price 
for government failure play out in Israel through these early stages. But but in America, we have exactly the same situation that preceded these attacks in, in, in Israel. And I'd like for you to talk about that, about the danger, as you see it, of the accumulation of the Lauren Boberts. Because, and I, and I want you to have the opportunity to denounce what you alluded to before, the equal repugnance of a Congresswoman Taib who can't, find it within herself to condemn the murder and burning alive of babies. But, but I'd like you to talk about the danger that you see. Because inevitably, right, there's a tipping point where if you have enough of these people, the whole thing can go down. And I think there's a real lack of imagination about that prospect. And I think we're seeing it at least a foreshadowing it play out with the absolute chaos and dysfunction in the House of Representatives, which means we cannot arm Ukraine and we cannot send aid to Israel at critical moments that has enormous implications for the peace and security of the world in the coming decade. Past couple weeks and you could go back a past couple of years. No one has been happier than Xi in China, Putin in Russia, the le the mullah leaders of Iran, and obviously Hamas, what used to be the PLO and the Palestinian Authority, that themselves is on the leader there. The leader I use in quotations is on year seventeen of a four year term. And, uh, you know, having some very close family members spend a lot of time in Israel this past summer and one work for the Israeli ambassador uh, to the U.S. this summer as well, uh, managing a lot of emotional uh, trauma uh, in our immediate family about everything that's happened over there. Um, there's no doubt that there are a tremendous amount of innocent Palestinians that are going to be harmed. But we need to look at the PLO going way back. We need to look at Hamas um, and terrorist organizations, without a doubt. And then the complete ineptness uh, um, of the Palestinian Authority of late. It's just it, the whole thing is horrible. But we have to remember that, especially regarding the U.S. House, the amount of um, some really bad people leading bad countries are literally laughing and cheering at us. Um, the heroism of the Ukrainian people and the government is is really, really important to honor. But to me, even a, the bigger question is, um, you know, God forbid Ukraine goes down, Putin is not stopping. And we need to realize it's not always fun in the short term or the medium term, but when the United States does not have uh, an involvement, uh, they don't need to, we do not need to be the policeman, police officer of the world. But we're, when we're not involved, people are very, very aware of that, and they will come in at all costs, uh, and that's human life to us, the human life of their own population who don't like their government. And it's important to make sure that we get our house, our literally and figuratively house in order uh, in Washington, D.C., to try to figure out how to pick a leader and put some rules in place. It's unbelievable um, the utter circus that is happening over there. Talking to some people uh, who were involved in some of the kerfuffles with the Clinton New Gingrich years, there was always a plan to come out of it. Um, from what I'm hearing, and I don't spend too much time talking to people or in DC, but from what I'm hearing now, literally um, since uh, Representative Gates spoke up, there's been no plan since McCarthy was put into office and speaker. Every 15 minutes was a new day. And it's unbelievable that it took this long for it to fall apart. And it's really, really important that we get our house in order and, and find people, uh, whether there's a Republican leader or Democratic leader, we just need a leader that is focused on the job at hand, which is a competency conversation to make sure our government stays open and making sure some of our closest allies are supported across the country. And you, you just see the utter circus happening 
And Representative Bobart seems to be very proud of that for some reason. I do not know why, because it's certainly not paying off for her uh, electorally. Um, and it's what happens when you have people that are focused on themselves and their Twitter accounts more than their constituents or their country. Um, we have a new feature as we have these conversations where we're asking our uh, guests to um, give their own warning uh, about what they see. And before I ask you to do that and conclude, um, let me just say again um, to everybody who is watching this, the election of this man, Adam Brish, to the United States Congress is a matter of concern, not just to his community, which is a beautiful part of the country filled with good people, badly served. We are all of us endangered by the accumulation of the insanity the imbecility, the nihilism, the extremism, and the utter lack of dignity, comportment, sense of rectitude, and probity. The United States of America is the most complicated society that has ever existed in the annals of human history. In fact, it is not even close. The leadership of the country elected by the American people at this moment in time, in so many cases, is beyond redemption, is unfit at a level of spectacularness that is frightening. It marks a decay, a regression, and raises a question, are we in fact capable of governing ourselves? Because the election through a system of redistricting and gerrymandering that has eviscerated the middle, given opportunity to all stripe of extremists and denied real choices has to be overcome. Or we're gonna lose the country. And in Colorado, there, there is an incandescent example of unfitness for public responsibility. And it's a case study. Winston Churchill once observed that in democracy, people get the government they deserve. And this is in fact a character test that we're faced and it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. What matters is the ability to recognize if someone's lying to you, abusing you, misinforming you, inciting you, dividing you for the purposes of their self-interest and power. As, as an adult, you have a responsibility as a citizen in the United States, to be involved, to pay attention, and to not be conned, to not be a mark. And for all of us together, as citizens of this great republic that spans 3,000 miles across a continent bound by two oceans, we share some incredible heritage in common. But the preservation of it absolutely requires a commitment to an idea that's amongst the deepest in all of human history. It's an idea about freedom, about liberty. 
And there's no person in the United States Congress that stands above Lauren Bober, though she's peers with Josh Hawley, peers with Ted Cruz, peers with Congresswoman Taib, peers with the most repugnant elements in American life. No one is her prisoner. And she can be defeated by this guy. And I encourage you, if you know people in Colorado, call them. If you got $10 or 50 or the maximum amount, send them the money. If you can make 100 volunteer calls for his campaign, make them. We have a national crisis that we, the people, have to find our ways out of. This man has stood up. Stand behind him. Support this candidacy to rid the United States Congress of a despicable, dishonorable, dis honest, incompetent. She is unfit. Help this man. And with that, let me turn it over to you. And anything that you'd like to say by way of a warning, we would love to hear. Thanks, Steve. I'll make one um, self-serving but country-serving point. All those names that everyone knows across the country, and there's a handful of them in the Republican Party, a little bit on the left as well. Lauren Boebert is the only person that has any chance of losing with all due respect to those that run against her and those that run against the other people uh, around the country, against those named brand chaos members. And so after you look after your own senator or house representative, please go to Adam for Colorado dot com and donate as well as um just as important at the end of the day just votes not money um hit that volunteer button and get going on that you know i think that there's a, a mathematical conversation and, and kind of a non-emotional conversation which is that our primary system is broken we have to figure out a way to have more open primaries 80 percent of these 435 districts in the country on the left and the right have been gerrymandered or are just self-sorting out and there's all the 95% of the action is happening at the primary level. We need to fix our primaries. There's a lot of conversations going out there. That's number one. Two, I want to shout the praises of a Grand Junction-based organization called RestoreTheBalance.org. And it was made up of a bunch of frustrated Democrat and Republicans and independents that got together. And they're trying to shed extremism on both sides. I think it has a chance to become a national type of organization, RestoreTheBalance.org, about trying to get principles, about getting people to meet in the middle and have conversations. But my warning or my ask on a higher level is just that we do have, and it might sound hokey, there's so much more in common than differences than people realize about making sure that people have safe schools and safe neighborhoods and clean air and clean water and economic opportunity and a border that is very, very secure, but also very, very humane and making sure that we honor those words of the Statue of Liberty that has made our country so great. It's out there. And just less time on the cable news networks, less time on Twitter, and more time trying to figure out how to build community at the community center, at a senior center, at your house of worship, uh, through the school boards, whatever it is, There's the, our country is so much better than how we're being portrayed now and of late. And our country is so much more um, unified than what this angertainment industry wants us to do. And there's a lot of profit behind this angertainment industry, and there's a lot of money to be made, um, whether it's candidates or people or the networks. We just have to figure out a way. And it's much more beyond a kumbaya type of moment. It is just that... Uh, especially I can vouch for spending a lot of time with a lot of different people. People just want the circus to stop and they want someone to focus on the job and turn down the noise and do not be afraid to reach out to people that you don't know that well, because they're probably just as concerned as you are, whether they're blue or red, purple, pink, yellow.
It does not matter. And that's my plea and that's my ask. And I appreciate you and the work that you're doing, Steve, and I and providing an opportunity to me to check in with a lot of important people across the country. So thank you very much. Everybody out there, let's help take her out of power, take her out of office, support Adam Frisch. Thank you very much for your time today. Good luck out on the campaign trail. Stay safe. Thanks, Steve. We'll see you around and stay healthy. Hang tough. You bet.